really like the spring of the year. I don't know about you all. Supposed to spring was supposed to have sprung just a few days ago, but instead of springing, I think it uh, kind of oozed downward. It get a little colder instead of warmer. But I'm glad for spring. I love spring because it reminds me of the resurrection. You know, when you look out and you see all those dead trees starting to put on leaves, it tells you that uh, there's some power at work there. And when you see the flowers coming out of the ground and blooming, it's just a wonderful time of the year because it renews my confidence and hope in the soon coming of the Lord and the resurrection morning. I really look forward to that. Don't you? This morning I want to talk to you a little bit about... uh, Foundations, building good foundations. Now, when I was a young boy, about seven or eight years old, my mother and my sister and I went to New York City. And we toured the city, and we just had a great time looking around New York. But the thing that impressed me more than anything else was the Empire State Building, because at that time, it was the tallest building in the world. It was 1,250 feet tall. And my sister and I started at the bottom and we started walking up towards the top and then we kind of gave out, you know, about halfway up and then we took the elevator all the way up. And what an amazing view. You could look down and you could see, you know, the uh, streets and the people that were walking around in the streets looked like little ants and little cars, and then you could look out over the city. Fantastic. Well, you know, I forgot all about skyscrapers until I moved to Chicago, and I started pastoring there in Chicago. And one day I was sitting down, and I was reading the newspaper, and uh, there was an article there about a man that had been arrested. He had been out trying to climb the John Hancock building. Now, the John Hancock building was a little bit shorter than the Empire State building. And he had been arrested for going out there and trying to climb that building. And they mentioned his name in this article. They said his name was Terry Snyder. And I said, Terry Snyder, that name sounds familiar. I wonder if it could be the Terry Snyder that I went to school with at Southern Missionary College. You know, we were right across from each other in the dormitory in Talge Hall. So I said, I'm going to go down to the police station and check it out. So I went down to the police station, and sure enough, it was the Terry Snyder that I knew. Now, he had been climbing that building, he told me, for publicity for his new business that he had started. It was an outdoor business, and he uh, specialized in, in uh, equipment for climbing. Well, to make a long story short, the police department let him go after he paid a fine and after he promised never to come back to Chicago and climb any more of their buildings. Skyscrapers are fascinating. I think today the the tallest skyscraper is, is found in Dubai. And it is twice the size, more than twice the size, of the Empire State Building is amazing. It's 2,722 feet tall. Now that is quite a structure. Now I hear the Chinese are thinking of building one that's even taller. Now I'm told that in order to build these skyscrapers, you've got to have a tremendous foundation. In fact, I've heard that some of these skyscrapers have foundations that are at least 10 12, 14 feet, or stories, not feet, but stories down under the ground. And most of these skyscrapers, they want to make sure that they build the foundation on solid rock. So they spend a lot of time making sure that those foundations that they use to build these skyscrapers are strong and firm. Now, it seems like there are a lot of people today that are building their foundations on chicken coop foundations. And they're using materials for their buildings that are pretty flabby. And when the storms come along, 
it doesn't take much to just destroy them. Now, the text I want us to look at this morning is found in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 11. For no other foundation can man lay that is laid than Christ Jesus. Nothing that you could do for yourself, for your family, for your neighbors, would be better than building your foundation on Jesus Christ. There's an interesting text that is found in uh, Ephesians, the ninth chapter, verse 18. And this, this text says, don't be uh, drunk with wine, which is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, all of us have seen drunks, I, I, I suppose, because they're all around us. And I could tell you many, many stories about drunks. But when a person drinks excessively, the wine that he drinks controls everything that he does, right? You know, he has a hard time speaking. He has a hard time walking. The alcohol controls every fiber of his being. Well, I don't think that... Uh, Christ is condoning the use of alcohol here because we've got plenty of texts in the Bible that tells us we shouldn't touch the stuff, right? But what God is doing here is he's comparing what an alcoholic experiences when he's filled with wine or liquor, comparing it to what we ought to experience when we're filled with the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit ought to control everything that we do and say all our activities that we're involved in. Now, I'm not talking about the, uh, the holy roller type of infilling of the Holy Spirit. When I was a young man at uh, Southern, I went to a, a Pentecostal meeting one time, and I was amazed. They had a rock band in there, and it was stirring up everybody, and people were falling all over the aisles. They were shouting and yelling, glory, hallelujah. Too many people want the thrill of the Holy Spirit, but they don't want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit in their lives. It's just like a dear saint in the South Pacific Islands said, it's not just talky-talky, but walky-walky. You know, there was a dear man that was late for church one day, and he got into the church, and he said to the deacon in the foyer, is the sermon over? And the deacon replied, yes, the sermon is over, but it's yet to be done. Now, in James, it tells us this. James, the first chapter, verse 22 and 24, it says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. If a man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man that's beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and he goes his way and forgets what manner of man he is. Now what they're saying here is this. Let's suppose that you get up early in the morning, and you're in a hurry, you're late for work, and you dress Quickly, you go in there and grab something for breakfast, and then just before you leave for work, you go and you look yourself into the mirror and see, is everything okay? And there's a big splotch on your shirt of ketchup that you dropped from the uh, eggs and potatoes you were eat eating that morning, and you look and you smile, and there's a big gob of um, spinach you know, in your teeth from the night before, and uh, you're unshaven, your hair's a big mess. Now, you'd think somebody was silly, wouldn't you? Who wouldn't make an effort to clean things up before they left? Well, we're told that the Bible shows us how God sees us. And the Bible tells us things in our life that we need to clean up and do. The Bible's a mirror. Every heart bypass patient 
is instructed by his physician about how he should live. If he doesn't get this instruction, I don't think your physician is a very good physician. Amen. You know, he tells you, now you've got to change the way you live. You know, there are certain things that you need to give up. You've got to give up those greasy foods. You've got to stop smoking. You need to get out and start exercising. That's hard for some people to do. You know, it's interesting. They've done a study. And they found out in this study that 90% of heart bypass recipients in two years are back to the old way of living. I have a buddy, a friend, who's had three bypass surgeries. And he said, I am not willing, I'm willing to give up everything, but I'm not willing to give up my beef. You know, I just cannot live without my steaks. Now, that's, that's kind of sad. Now, it's the same way in our Christian life. Our physician comes along and tells us there's some changes that you need to make in your life. And you ought to be willing to make those changes to live. It's either change or, or die. Now, it's like the Word of God. We need to be willing to do what God's Word tells us to do. I once had a friend that uh, went with me to the seminary. And he was take, uh, getting a degree in advanced theology, and I was getting a degree in theology at the same time. And we were companions in the same classes. And one day, we were sitting and talking, and I said to him, Jim, have you always been a Seventh-day Adventist? And he said, no, I've not always been a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, well, how did you become a Seventh-day Adventist? And he said, well, it's an interesting story. He says, I was originally studying to become a Baptist minister. And he says, I was getting ready to go to the Baptist seminary and study for the Baptist ministry. And he said, I got drafted. So I, he, I, went, into the, I went into the army and he said, some of the guys in my barracks like to go out on the weekends and drink and then get drunk. But he said, I was the only one among that group that didn't drink. I was a teetotaler. So I'd go along with them when they'd go out on Saturday nights and I'd hang around until they got good and drunk, and it was time for us to go back to the barracks, and I would drive them home. He said, sometimes I'd take my Bible, and I'd sit in the corner of the bar and read my Bible. He said, other times I'd go to a restaurant and eat at the restaurant. Then when it got a little later, I'd go by and see if these guys were ready. And he's, I've got these guys in the car, and he said, there was one fellow that always sat on the front seat. And he was drunk. And he said, when we were driving back to the base, he'd give me the most wonderful Bible studies you ever thought of. He said he'd tell me about the state of the dead. He'd tell me about the Sabbath. He'd talk about the investigative judgment. And he gave all of these texts, proof texts. And he said, I got, so I really enjoyed going out with these guys because I got all these wonderful Bible studies, you know, going back to the base. And then I'd go back and he said, I'd, get my Bible out, and I'd start reading, and I couldn't prove this guy wrong. He said, this guy was just right about everything, except he wasn't righteous. He was right, but not righteous. And then I said, well, what happened? He said, well, he said the conversion uh, was automatic, because he said, I first loved the Lord. He said, I had a relationship with the Lord before I ever became a Seventh-day Adventist. But he said, I love God so much that when I found out how he lived and the things that he did and the things that he wanted me to do, I was willing to do those things. And he said, it just became natural for me to become a Seventh-day Adventist because I wanted to follow and live my life like Jesus did. So... 
it would be wonderful. And he, and he also went on to say one other thing. He said, the reason I could change so easily was that I knew that I had all the power available that was necessary for me to change. Because he said, I knew the Holy Spirit would help me in the changes that I made. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if each one of us was filled by the Holy Spirit that enabled us to live a life like Christ wanted us to live? You know, it's not just knowing the doctrines that's important. The doctrines do not save us. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that saves us. In Matthew, the, 27th, uh, the seventh chapter, and verse 24 to 27, Jesus was a carpenter, right? He was a builder. And he knew something about construction. And so he compared the building of buildings with uh, storms. And in the first building, he said that, Therefore, whoever, whoever hears these sayings of mine and doth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which buildeth his house upon the rock. So what he's saying here, there's one builder that builds a house, and he builds that house on what kind of foundation? A rock. And so he says the one that builds his house on the rock is a wise man. But he says, it's the one that builds and does what I ask him to do, right? Then there's a second kind of building, and he says, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Now here are two believers, and there's one word that makes the difference between these two believers. What is that word? Do, right? One does, the other one doesn't. One reads and does. One reads and does not. Now, you remember the story of Cain and Abel? There are two kinds of believers. Those who do what God asks. Who did what God asked him to do? Abel did, right? And as a consequence, God honored him by consuming his sacrifice. Now, there was another boy who was a believer, but he wanted to do his own thing. He thought he knew better than God. And so rather than doing what God asked him to do, he did his own thing. 2 Timothy 3.16. We know that Scripture is given to us to help us live our lives daily. And God tells us that Scripture is given to us by His inspiration and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and for righteousness. So if you daily search the Scriptures and learn of Christ in those Scriptures and learn what He wants you to do, it will change you because it can reprove you, correct you, instruct you, and make you righteous. Now, we need to get back to fundamentals. And this is the fundamental. Doctrines are important, but what saves us is knowing and loving Jesus. That's the basic foundation that anybody can lay is to love and know Jesus. To any Christian growth, that's the basic foundation. The materials that we use in our buildings are the doctrines. Now, you can't have a good building without good what? A good foundation, and you can't have a good building without good materials, right? So you can have a foundation in Christ, but you also need to include what he asked you to do and the things that he asked you to do. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But first, you've got to do what? First, you've got to love. And then you do what he asks you to do. These are just basics. These are the fundamentals. Love Jesus. Now, a few years ago, there was a coach who coached uh, 
the uh, basketball team at UCLA. His name was John Wooden. And he was probably one of the most, well, the winningest coach of basketball, college basketball around. And the success for his winning teams was that he practiced incorporating fundamentals into his team. Every year when he started out the season, he would gather all his team members together, and a lot of them were new recruits from high schools all around the area. A lot of them had played all during high school, and they thought they were pretty good. But he'd gather them all together, and he says, I want to start with the fundamentals. And so uh, they were kind of curious, what are the fundamentals that he's going to start with? And he said, first thing I want to start with is how to put on your socks. They said, what? He said, yes. He said, that's fundamental to playing basketball. He says, if you put on your socks the wrong way and you have wrinkles in your socks, those wrinkles can cause blisters and blisters can ruin your performance. So he started with the very fundamentals. And there's a nice little lady that I really respect. Her name is Ellen White. And she talked about fundamentals. She said this in Great Controversy. Those who are unwilling to accept the plain cutting truth of the Bible are continually seeking pleasing fables that will quiet the conscience, too wise in their own conceit to search the scriptures with contrite soul and earnest prayer for divine guidance. They have no shield from delusion. And then she goes on to say, all who neglect the word of God to study convenience and policy that they may not be at variance with the world will be left to receive damnable heresy. Good advice. Now, all of us, if we live long enough, are going to have storms in our life. We're going to have all kinds of little problems. Afflictions, trials, fears, pain, temptations, heresies, all of these things are going to be involved in our life. I don't know of anybody that's lived any length of time without having some problems. You know, all of us are going to suffer a train wreck or two, you know, as we go through life. But what's important is getting back up and going forward. You know, that's what's important. I read this text the other day in Jeremiah, the 12th chapter, verse 5. It's an interesting text. And what this text says is that if you can't face the small problems today, when things are nice and peaceful, what are you going to do when things get tough, when there's the swelling of the Jordan and the floods come and the problems come? What are you going to do? And the only way that we can face life's problems is to have a relationship with Jesus, a daily relationship with Jesus. We're hearing more and more about problems that are happening in the world. And we as Seventh-day Adventists know that we're going to face huge problems in the future. We will live through, it says, famine, pestilence, Earthquakes, wars. Are those all happening right now? It says this is just the beginning of our problems and our trials. And then we're told in Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 21, there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. We haven't seen nothing yet, right? And Satan is going to descend with great fury. He's going to come at us with an overwhelming flood. How are we going to be able to stand against all of this? The only way that we're going to be able to stand against all of the delusions of the last days and the storm that's to break upon the earth is to have a firm foundation in Jesus. And we have to begin now, not put it off, but do it now while we still have 
sufficient time and peace to do it. Did you know that uh, back in 1945, in July, there was a pilot by the name of um, Smith, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Smith, who was piloting a B-25 Mitchell bomber. He was going from an Army Air Force base on the other side of New York to Newark, New Jersey, to pick up some Army personnel. And he got to the place where he was going to descend to make a landing at the airport, but the weather was terrible, and visibility was zero. And the airport tower told him, don't land. You can't see enough to land. But Lieutenant Colonel Mitchell decided he was going to do it anyway. He was a good pilot. And he went on and began his descent. And lo and behold, there was a break in the clouds. And um, it scared him because when he was in this break of the clouds, he saw that it was on a collision course with the Chrysler building in New York. So he suddenly made a veer with the plane and he ran in to the 78th floor of the Empire State Building. There was a huge explosion, and there were 14 people that were killed. There was a big hole left in the side of the building. It took $17 million to repair that big hole, but the building stood. There was a huge fireball, fire everywhere. It's the only time that I know of in history where a fire has been, they have been able to put out a fire on a skyscraper of that height. It took them 40 minutes, and they finally got the, the fire out. But the building stood because the materials that they used for construction of that building were so strong that it withstood that impact, and because the foundation of that building was firm. My question for all of us today is, Are you constructing a building that will stand the storms of life? My hope is that we will spend time with Jesus. You know, Ellen White says that we ought to spend an hour a day contemplating the scenes of the cross. If anything will help you to love Jesus, it's thinking about what he did for you. And when you fall in love with Jesus, then you need to be willing to do what he asks you to do. It's not just walkie, talkie, talkie, but walkie, walkie. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for all the things that you have done for us. We realize that soon the storms are going to break upon us. We know that Jesus has made provision for each one of us. He's given us power so that we can live our lives for him. Help us to be willing to do what he asks us to do. Help us to be willing to build our foundation on Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.